First of all, good evening, welcome. Thank you very much for uh, joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to start with a, an obvious apology in as much that you've actually got to look at my ugly mug on uh, the side of the, the screen, as well as hopefully seeing all the goodies that are going to be showing in the way in photographs. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to change slightly um, everything to do with the, the Gretna side of it. We're going to open it up because there aren't that many photographs to do with um, the actual drill practices and what the uh, firefighters at Gretna actually got up to in the way of practicing drills, etc. So <clears throat> we're going to involve other munition factories and predominantly female munition workers who acted as firefighters. Now, additionally, I'm not aware as to exactly how many of you um, are aware of, of the build up to the Great War and all of that. So I'm just going to, uh, Laura, do you want me to enter this guy? Sorry, I was muted. I've clicked enter, but he's having some difficulty joining. I'm going to try and message him. So, yeah, don't worry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll uh... No, right. OK, in that case, we'll continue. And um, we're obviously going to start with today's presentation, which is why Gretna happened. And most people will say it's because of what happened 28th of August, Nine, uh, sorry, 28th of June 1914, when uh, Franz Ferdinand, good name for a band, um, and Sophie, his wife, were assassinated in uh, the Bosnian um, Herzegovina town of Sarajevo. Now, something that a lot of people perhaps aren't that knowledgeable about is the fact that this if you like, was the spark that caused the First World War. The Austro-Hungarian military and also the German military were growing um, powers who wanted to, uh, if you like, try themselves out uh, against opposition. The Austro-Hungarian military in particular had been for a number of years trying to go to war with somebody to prove how good they were. What happened in uh, Sarajevo basically was the spark that caused the powder keg to explode. However, Franz Ferdinand had already been warned as the um, crown heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that this was going to be a very dangerous state of affairs on the 28th of June. 28th of June to the Bosnian Serbs and to Serbia is one of their most important dates. It's St uh, Vitus Day, and St Vitus Day commemorates the Battle of Kosovo, which was won by the Serbs in a, uh, 1389, 28th of June. Unfortunately, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had not only annexed Serbia, but it had brought in certain draconian um, laws, which meant that there was a lot of dissatisfaction the newspapers, bless their little cotton socks, decided to not only print the route Franz Ferdinand was going to be using, but also the times he was going to be in a certain place. This brought about the fact that we have this situation where he's killed on the 28th of 
June. The military in Austria, Hungary go to the Germans and say, we want to go to war. But if we go to war against Serbia, we're pretty sure that Russia and France will come in on the Serbian side and it all starts kicking off to the degree that, as you can see, uh, Serbia is uh, under law, under martial law and is uh, under wartime from the 28th of July, August the 1st, Germany start declaring war on everybody else. But France in particular doesn't realise that the Germans are going to go through what was hopefully going to remain very neutral. And that was Luxembourg and Belgium and then come back round in to the north of France. We, because of what happens in Belgium, give an ultimatum to the Germans. The Germans don't take any notice of it and say no. And so we declare war 4th of August, 1914. Now, what happens then is that um, as you can see by the photo here, you've got all these men that are in the fire brigade, the police, the ambulance services, nurses, doctors, whatever, being called up for national service. Mobilization throughout Europe starts. A mobilization for Britain meant 700,000 troops within a couple of weeks could be mobilized. The standing army of Britain at that time was only 250,000. Poor little Serbia only had half a million troops. Austro-Hungary mobilized within the first week, 1.8 million. Russia, we're looking at five and a quarter million troops. Germany, 4.4 million and France, 3.7 million. So as you can see, it's already started. You then get the issue regarding um, Kitchener, um, Haig and Kitchener and John French, who were the British commanders, and everybody knows the famous Kitchener poster saying, we want you to come and fight for the country. Well, that's great. So long as you've got enough weapons, boots, uniforms, and all of that, we hadn't. And because of that, we opened up lots of factories, munitions factories, and that could include national filling factories, it could include places making boots, it could be uh, include uh, railway works in Darlington, Doncaster, Derby, um, a couple around the Manchester area, all producing shells. Now one in particular, and I'm showing these ones, um, they were put all in by Lloyd George, David Lloyd George, who became in May 1915, the first minister of munitions. Now, I won't bore you to tears with telling you what I think about David Lloyd George, but it's not good because um, it, basically they controlled military expenditure. To then start criticizing the military for how they did it when they actually stopped the military buying stuff was a little bit underhanded. So, the photographs you're seeing on the screen at the moment, National Filling Factory pays in Middlesex. For anybody that knows the railway line that, you, that runs between Paddington and Swindon, on the outskirts of Southall, uh, there was a, a Nestle factory and it produced coffee, 
chocolate or cocoa and other bits and you could smell when you went past the factory that was where Hayes National Film Factory was they employed roughly uh, about 5,000 people over 200 acres there were around 400 buildings on the site but what makes these special is they had a professional female fire brigade. Uh, they didn't have motorised fire appliances, they relied on static uh, fire pumps. Uh, one was produced by uh, Mather and Platt, uh, famous uh, manufacturers in Manchester, and others um, were produced by uh, were, were Dennis. These two photographs are good examples of what female firefighters would do in the way of drill. The guy with the peak cap on, directing operations, is um, an instructor from London Fire Brigade. And whilst he would only instruct, the lady with the axe is actually the senior officer of the fire brigade at that time. And I'll explain how we know that uh, a little bit later. Um, this is a, a photograph and it shows quite plainly uh, their, their dress. They, they had T9 tunic, belt axes, but only peak caps. They didn't have what we would know as proper fireman's helmets. And just to prove the point, the lady in the background has got a sou'wester with a rank, a, a rank marking on it. Um, Anorak Crompton, I'm sorry, will tell you that she was a squad leader. Um, the uh, oil skin was only used by officers it wasn't for the normal firefighters so they got wet and if they had more than one call they would have two uniforms and for those firemen amongst you who remember t9 tunics once they got wet they were wet for days so you needed a spare set and this is how we know about rank structure because the lady on the far left is a sergeant the lady um, third from the right was a senior officer because she has all the stuff on the on her sleeve and the lady next door to her was a section leader who was in effect a corporal. Very few fire brigades at that time operated what we would know now as fire brigade rank structure. They were mostly military um, in their, um, their methods. Now, this one um, is also of a, a explosive factory rather like Gretna, but this one was Queensferry up near Chester. And Queensferry had its own fire brigade, um, professional, both men and women. Um, the women also undertook watchroom duties. They undertook a lot of other duties. This actually was a visit to uh, Queensferry by the King. And there's the King and Queen being introduced to the Chief Fire Officer um, with the fire women and the men resplendent in Southwesters and Ministry of Munitions Brass Fire Helmets. And for anybody who's uh, an anorak like I am about fire brigade stuff, the badges were no different. There was nothing to actually say on them that it was Ministry of Munitions or anything like that. It was just a normal Merryweather cross back piece, and, and that was it. But what sets 
Queensbury out was the fact that the firewomen manned the fire engine. They didn't drive it, but they manned it. And this is it. This is a Dennis end series um, arrived beginning of um, 1918. The fire brigade ran three stations and at least two of the stations had a female complement every day, every night shift. So the female fire brigades, they attended a number of incidents, both within the factory and also rather like Gretna, Queensferry had its own village called Mancock Royal, uh, 160 houses, brick houses, and six very large hostels. And the hostels were full of um, mostly Australians. So um, as you can see, we're getting into the Commonwealth, people joining in. Um, now I'm showing this because uh, they say it, at a North Country factory. Well, we immediately know where this is. It was number one shell filling factory, Barnbo uh, on the outskirts of Leeds. Um, the fire brigade there was purely volunteer with a couple of full time instructors from Leeds City Fire Brigade. The fire pump uh, was housed in a little wooden hut at the top of. The picture and it was attached to a very large reservoir um, and the girls once a week had fire drill. Now when we say volunteers during the First World War some of the volunteers are actually paid. Now my grandfather fighting in the First World War he was paid seven and six a week for being in the trenches with the Royal Field Artillery. These guys, on top of their wages, would receive one and six a week for drills, and they would also get a call out fee. And some of them would even receive three and six for being on call for the fire service. So you could make a little bit of money. However, let's change the photo. However, these guys received uh, a, a number of commendations um, around December 19, hang on a minute, let me just check that I'm getting it right, 1916, December 1916, it was a very serious explosion. Killed 35 women, but injured at least 100. Hi all, I think we just had a bit of a technical blip. Um, I will just make Nigel the co-host again and we will uh, continue on. Co-host. There we go, Nigel, you should be able to share your screen again. I think we're back in. Perfect. Right, let me go back because um, I, I'm not sure um, if everybody picked up what I was saying about commendations. They received commendations based on the fact that not only did they deal with the fire, but they also dealt with rescue work and unfortunately helped with body recovery. Um, now, I appreciate it's a Monday evening and some of you may be having your dinner, so we won't go into that too much. But suffice to say, these guys proved their worth. Uh, right. Now we're coming on to more nitty gritty of what Gretna fire women and firemen would have been doing. This is a picture taken 
taken at Pembury, and Pembury the Munition Works was down in South Wales, and this shows the ladies doing their fire drill, complete with the military officer on the left, who was the danger building officer, lounging up against a Ministry of Munitions hose car, and they're using extinguishers. And the next photo I'll show you is, unfortunately, they've, um, the, the Ministry of Munitions tried um, to add in some smoke unsuccessfully. Um, I also would venture to suggest that if that was carrying munitions, you wouldn't want all those young ladies stood there with um, buckets ready to put a fire out. But we also have in the First World War a number of what we termed royal factories, including the Royal Gunpowder Factory, Royal Small Arms Factory, and obviously Royal Arsenal Woolwich. This photo is taken at um, the Royal Gunpowder Factory, and it shows a different style War Office hose truck. Uh, at this stage, Royal Gunpowder Factory did not have a motorised fire brigade. It had um, a number of professional firemen, about six, and then relied on the workers doing their bit as volunteers. Um, and as we're talking about Gretna, I thought I'd chuck this one in. This is um, the safety services patrol at um, Georgetown, which is up near Glasgow in the Second World War and afterwards became Royal Ordnance Factory Bishopton. Uh, these guys were not only responsible for firefighting, they were responsible for searching, they were responsible for uh, looking after the equipment, but above all, they were there to deal with any emergency that they were called on. So unlike the ones you saw previously, where there were also police officers, these guys would um, doing two jobs at once, if you like. Now, there is another photo, and I'll show you that one. Um, Glasgow Fire Brigade covered Georgetown and they sent in fire engines. Now, on certain websites, you'll see that Georgetown had its own fire engine. No, it didn't. Uh, the photo was taken at a Glasgow fire station because the fire women actually went to visit to do fire prevention talks and also learn about helping Glasgow Fire Brigade if there were incidents. So with that, we're now coming now no closer to, um, to, dare I say, Dumfries and Galloway, and we're going to look at what there was in 1914, slightly before the um, retina was built. So where the big number two is, that's Carlisle. Carlisle had a police fire brigade um, and two fire engines. Um, Dumfries, there were two fire engines. Uh, there was one fire engine, sorry, a manual. And also uh, across the river uh, in Maxwell Town, there was another fire brigade, but that only had a host car. Moffat had a fire engine. Castle Douglas had a fire engine. But where you see the green triangles, literally all they had was a, a hose cart or a few lengths of hose. They didn't actually have what we would term in 1914 uh, a, a fire brigade. Right, <clears throat> one for the archives and one for the fire brigade people amongst us. This is the steamer Usk from Langholm, Castle Douglas. And I'm gonna show this one, Muffet because later on, um, you'll see certain bits and pieces to do with, with um, Moffitt. This is Carlisle Fire Brigade, um, complete with their uh, pump escape. 
This was the only fire appliance that attended the Quintons Hill disaster. So we're going now to look at um, the factory. Um, it's producing, as you can see, research formula, department formula B, cordite. And um, Messrs Pearsons were uh, the construction managers for many years. They kept some brilliant archives, but they asked uh, the Ministry of Munitions in October 1915 about fire insurance. The government reply was, government didn't have fire insurance. They would rather let things burn and then rebuild. So, in mid-December, they uh, employed Peter Methram from Edinburgh as the first fire master. And as you can see, the fire engine started coming on site. But before we actually get into that, let's look at the risks that are involved in producing 700 tonnes of cordite a week. And I won't read the whole lot, but that's how much acid and other items you need to produce 700 tonnes of cordite a week. And there's a lot there. Um, and it's all dangerous, as you can see by the number of tonnes involved. Let's put it in, into perspective. Retina, nine miles long, two miles wide. We have um, an acid section and um, a large nitro um, cotton waste section. And also by the side of the cotton waste, was a, there was an alcohol reception area. And in Scotland, the distilleries would provide the alcohol. So um, because uh, of the draconian Dora Defence of the Realm Act, which said you couldn't buy around for people, you could have to have watered down beer, you couldn't sell spirits in certain areas. The distilleries sold their alcohol for product production. Um, we've then got a nitroglycerin uh, section, a very large power station, which required tons of coal. Uh, you had an ether section, which also, believe it or not, next door, had storage facilities for 500 tons of alcohol. You then had the cordite drying area. And then to finish off, you have the magazines. Now, the magazines themselves could hold 6,000 tons of cordite. So had they had a problem there, the River Usk would be quite a large river by now. Um, right. So now let's put this into perspective. Um, we can see here um, that in a ton of cordite, there are 2,240 pounds uh, of cordite. Now that's enough to produce that, but that's from one ton. You are producing there 700 to 800 tons a week. And that's what it looks like in the 303. But if we then take it to an 18 pounder shell, and we then start getting into the big numbers. So that's how much cordite they could use to fire that number of shells. And I'll show you this one. Again, the cordite is a long stringy stuff uh, that looks like spaghetti. And as it turns out, this is a cut down shrapnel shell. Um, but let's just look at how much they actually produce. So up until the end of January 1919, Gretna produced 54,800 tons of cordite. And uh, thanks to an online calculator, this is how much or how many 18 pounded shells you could have fired. Not all the cordite was used uh, for that. 
And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, you are still finding uh, ammunition and shells and other bits and pieces on the Western Front. And in Mesopotamia, in um, Salonika, North Russia, wherever there was a battle in East Africa, because Gretna was the, not the only place producing cordite. Uh, Queensbury produced cordite. Uh, Holton Heath produced cordite for the, for the Navy. Now, um, if anybody wants to know what happened to it afterwards, I would suggest that if you go fishing between um, Stranra and Northern Ireland and uh, bring the triangle down to the top of the Isle of Man, don't go fishing there. There's a place called um, Beaufort Dyke, and it's a, 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 an undersea uh, dumping ground. And a conservative estimate is there's about 2 million tonnes of spent ammunition down there. So I wouldn't advise trying to swim across it either. So after nearly half an hour, we're now going to talk finally about Gretna's Fire Brigade. And we'll start with this one, just to keep everybody happy. Um, right hand side, William Thompson. We'll talk about William later. It's one of the Merryweathers, and we can tell that it's um, one that uh, Peter Methven brought in because Peter Methven was uh, with Edinburgh Fire Brigade, and Edinburgh Fire Brigade had the name of the Fire Brigade on the ladders, didn't actually have it on the vehicle. Um, I'll move on to the fire brigade. We'll talk about the um, a bit later. Right, okay, fire stations. Uh, we had, um, to start with, Croft Road, then the headquarters station, then we had East Riggs at the Rand, Mill Hill Yard, and finally Black Bank. And there they are on the map. Um, Croft Road, operational late December 1916 to mid-16. Black Bank operational to 1918-19. Mill Hill Yard, very small. Only uh, a couple of watchmen working there with a hose cart, but they were covering what was the main stores uh, depot and where a lot of the construction equipment was kept. So they, you know, they weren't busy. Um, I think operationally, if they attended more than about uh, five calls in that period, uh, that's all we know of. So let's look at some photographs. Or, uh, right, okay. This is Black Bank. And um, for those of you who know that area of Longtown. This is um, where the officers' mess is uh, at Black Bank. Um, small station, uh, only had uh, a, a response vehicle, um, but it was uh, extremely busy because of Fordite Range. Mill Hill Yard, little more than a tin shack with um, a waiting room for the firemen to wait to do something and a covered area for the host car. Um, that's the central area. This is Croft Road in Gretna where the first fire station was. And the headquarters station, as you can see, large building, um, Peter Methven stood uh, in naval gear um, by the fire engine on the right, uh, left hand side. Uh, there's another photo of it with the Dennis outside, um, complete with a 60 foot hose tower. Um, and uh, the, the chief officer actually had a motorcycle to use. Uh, this is East Riggs. Um, it's, uh, it was opened, it was much more substantial, and two of the firemen lived above. 
So they were on call virtually all the time. And in an emergency, they came down the stairs at the back in, into the station, normally the drivers. Um, there's a bit better photo of the Dennis, one of the, the Dennis fire appliance, another end series, and one of the Ford 20 horsepower cars that was done up as uh, what we would know as a rapid response vehicle with a bit of ladder down one side, some lengths of hose, P and bar to get into hydrants and fire extinguishers. And in the background, there is the, one of the own shots uh, of a bit of the steam fire engine that they had. Um, they had a, a Sham Mason uh, fire engine. Um, this is a list of all the vehicles that they used. Um, as you can see, it was quite an extensive list of fire, uh, fire appliances and had the war continued, there were plans in 1918 to bring in a second Dennis N series, um, 60 horsepower, and that would have gone to Black Bank. Um, they would have upgraded Black Bank. Um, Right, now we'll look at the fire engines. Right, um, we were lucky enough to actually track down the test certificates for the fire engines. And as you can see, um, they're, they're the Merryweathers, and the, this is one of the Merryweathers. Um, that is the other Merryweather. Um, but my favorite, obviously, is the Dennis M series. Um, and that is it. And, and I uh, will bow to uh, a gentleman called Gordon uh, Routledge, who has written many books on Gretna. And his uh, view is that this photo was taken when the fire engine was actually leaving. And we'll discuss what happened to the vehicles after the war a bit later. Um, there's the Dennis again, taken around 1923, um, with our friend, Mr. Um, Thompson, stood there talking to one of the firemen. Um, believe that to be one of the drivers because he's actually already in fire kit. Um, this is number five. Um, and uh, number five steamer from Edinburgh. It was purchased for Gretna. Operationally, it never attended an incident and it was sold fairly quickly after the end of the war. And even though they bought it in 1916 for 150 pounds, they only got 42 pounds for it at the end. Now, again, we haven't found out where it went yet. We're still trying. Uh, this photo I wanted to show you because it's okay not at Gretna, but it shows a Ministry of Munitions hose car in its full glory. You know, it's the money. But also, it's, um, it shows a stretch of, uh, as used by the medical teams on munition factories. Now, uh, anybody who's been in an ambulance these days will know it's not the most comfy ride, but I would venture to suggest that compared to what people in 1915, 16, 17, and 18 um, were put through, um, I think I prefer today's ambulance than that. This was a photograph, just for those of you that are interested in history, taken at Trench Warfare uh, Gas Filling Factory in Watford. Uh, hence why the guys have got the mind rescue helmets. Um, it was, uh, they were there purely and simply because of people being overcome by the gases that they were putting into shells. And that is a close up of one of the 20 horsepower um, rapid response vehicles. And that was based at East Riggs. 
Now, the other thing that was based at East Riggs, and we haven't got a photo of it, was a fire brigade ambulance. Um, the ambulance service were based for quite a while at the fire station. And you'll find that a number of newspaper articles will say that people were transported by the fire brigade ambulance to the hospital, or whether it was the works hospital, whether it was Cumberland Infirmary down in Carlisle, or whether they went to Annan or on to some freaks. Um, they were very busy, as you might expect. Uh, there were a number of fatal accidents. Um, there were a number of fires. And um, it, it was not a, a, a safe place, if you like, to work. Now, I'll put this in because I think it gives a, a clue as to how the fire brigade grew and then how it diminished as the factory closed. So this, as you can see, is in December, December 1916. Now, confusingly, a fire master down in the south of England is known for being in charge of a gunpowder factory. So he was responsible for gunpowder production. So up in Scotland, however, a fire master is in charge of the fire service, fire brigade. And today, uh, north of the border, it's a fire master. Um, south of the border, it's a fire chief. But as you can see, they've also got the auxiliary brigade, a volunteer brigade based at central office and the train police. Um, by February 1918, it's grown. It's grown dramatically. Um, the, the number of trained factory workers in February 1918, they say was over 500. And I have no reason to doubt that. Male and female, there was no difference. They held competitions against each other. And um, a, a, a jewellers in Carlisle called Wheatley provided them with a silver cup. I'd love to know what happened to that. And um, they, uh, every time they had a horticultural um, uh, fair or a show, they would have these hose running competitions and knocking down a target with the homes and all that sort of stuff. So, as you can see, a fire master in February 1918, a large number of people to call upon, including the volunteer fire brigade. Now, this group uh, were based at Mossman, which was the Cordite Ranges, Cordite Pace Houses. And if we show them, earlier we were asked about the badges that appeared on the on the, on the title page for my talk. Those are the badges. Uh, each one was numbered and that's it. And with that, and I think, no, I haven't, let's go back. Um, with that, if you had your factory pass and there was a fire, you would be allowed into any area of the factory. Now, if there was no fire, you would only be allowed into a certain area, which your pass was designed for. But if you had the badge and a factory pass, say, for instance, you worked at Mossman, if there was a fire in, um, so to give an example, in the nitroglycerin hills, um, and you wanted to go and help, you would be allowed to go in and help. And that's how the system worked. By 1922, 1923, when it was all closing up and being sold off, the fire brigade had dropped dramatically. And as you can see, there's still the auxiliary brigade. The auxiliary brigade, most of the time, helped man the fire engine. They were trained how to use 
the equipment on the fire brigade uh, engines and would go out to fight fires. Now, I'll let you just browse those. Um, they had breathing apparatus, um, but most of the time they relied on the rescue teams that were based within the acid section. Um, they were trained by Mind Rescue, and as you can see, there was a lot of equipment to keep um, in, in check, if you like. And one of the fascinating facts about Gretna are the details to do with how much everything was spent on. Um, we know how much. Um, we know what a fire engine cost them. We know um, what a hydrant system was costing them. We know what repairs to uh, one of the pumping stations cost them. Everything was uh, logged down to the last minute penny. Um, the, the steamer not only had drag ropes so it could be pulled by men, um, but it also had um, harnesses so that horses could be uh, used to pull it anywhere. Um, Gretna had a, a number of horses, mostly used for agricultural work, granted, but they had horses and the horses would be available to pull the fire engine and, and one of the ambulances, the horse ambulance as well. So that gives you a clue as to what there was there. Um, fires within the area, um, this was a drying stove, uh, it, sh it should be a drying stove, it's no longer a drying stove. Um, there were a number of fatal fires involving these drying stoves, um, and as you can see, there wasn't that much for the fire engines to do when they got there, it was basically a burnout. Um, but they also attended other incidents. And this is a railway accident on the private railway within Gretna. Uh, they went because obviously back then the, the trains were driven by coal. And because of what had happened at Quintins Hill with the coal setting fire to the wooden carriages, etc., etc., that's why. The fire brigade turned up for that one. There's a better shot of one of the steam trains. Um, hope Rob's still with us because he'll know exactly what that one is. Um, and then there was a dirty bag store, basically, um, waste um, came, waste cotton came in bags, it was put into storage, and as you can see. 12th of the 9th, 1917, it burned out. Uh, that's another um, picture of it. Um, that's another drying unit. And uh, Explosions. There were a number of explosions. This is the one that claimed the life of Roberta Robertson. And we show this one basically to show A, the damage to um, buildings not within the actual Nitro Christian Hill, but it was basically to uh, it, it, it was concussion damage. Um, that's another picture of it, of, of a different part of Nitro Christian Hill 4. Um, it's showing again damage to that building. Um, interestingly, this group of uh, females, every one of them is smiling and laughing. Um, personally, working there, I wouldn't be smiling and laughing, but um, they appear to be uh, smiling for the cameraman. Now, if we go back, you can see uh, in the background the, um, the escape tunnel there on the left hand side through the bun wall. 
if you look there over on the right hand side you'll see it actually within the nitroglycerin hill that exploded and that's what's left within there now the problem is that unlike at Wolfram Abbey where the uh, escape tunnels are curved to try and prevent um, concussion damage the ones at Gretna and escape tunnels were straight through so subsequently the blast went straight through the escape tunnel and damaged other properties um, now Gretna not only fought fires within its own area it went out and fought fires out in the local community because still in 1918, 1919, 1920, they were the only motorized fire brigade for miles. And as you can see, they attended a few bits and pieces, including the Cars Biscuit Lorry. Um, I hope Cars gave them a few free boxes of biscuits afterwards. Um, there's, uh, just to show uh, an anor real anorak, that's um, showing all of the different uh, fires and and where they were and where they went to. And hopefully the next shot, uh, I said that we would be talking about Moffitt earlier. Now Moffitt Fire Brigade was a uh, volunteer fire brigade with a manual fire engine, horse drawn, and they actually caught to fire in 1921 where the whole of that building was on fire with one all strong fire engine and that's what it looks like or looked like we should say none of it remains there it's um it, it, I, from what i've been told there's a few foundations but not a lot else um sorry about the state of it but that's what it looked like uh, as you can see, it was a total um, gut job. They phoned Gretna, Gretna turned out. Frosty evening, it took over an hour and a half to get there. Um, and unfortunately, a couple of them were actually injured by falling masonry. But they were treated by um, one of the Moffitt doctors and returned to service and uh, the fire engine from Gretna was there for quite a while um, and that's a picture of them fighting it uh, although it's not very clear I apologize the newspaper photos from 100 years ago are not that brilliant then we've got this one which was a very large um, factory fire in Maxwell town and this fire was responsible for what happened later with um, increasing the fire cover in some priests in that area. Um, they went to a number of stately homes that burnt down and that it was mainly because they were the only ones that could attend it. And even then for some of the runs, it was up to an hour and a half, two hours for them to get there. Well, you imagine if it's a windy, blustery night, it's going to take a lot of work to stop it taking out the whole building. And this one, Dalruskan House, was a total gut job. Um, the last fire widely reported, as you can see, is this one. Um, 1st of September 1922. And unfortunately, the fire brigade had been uh, disbanded. August, late August 1925, and it was that that gives us the title of nearly a decade of fires and firefighting. Because had they gone on for another couple of months, they would have made, dare I say, the decade, but they didn't. So uh, that's the actual date of this family. Um, now, will um do the th this is a project that we're involved with with laura and devon's porridge 
to do family history and try and find out a little bit about the guys. Um, we've also tried to track down a copy of This Is Your Life, um, the, the one from 1956. Unfortunately, they haven't got one because um, I think it would be quite fascinating. Um, Thompson uh, died in service in 1939. He'd been a long time member of Edinburgh, went to um, Gretna as um, Peter Methven's deputy. And then in 1923, he transferred over to Dumfries. And because of what had happened at the, the, the factory fire, Dumfries had actually gone out and bought himself another Dennis N series fire engine and there it is. Um, so Dumfries finally got a motorised fire engine. Um, Stephen Lawson, very interesting character, became fire master um, at Gretna after Thompson had, had left to go to, um, to Dumfries. He went on to become fire master in uh, Oban but had also been fire master in Gala Shields and um, a, a number of paperworks, including Valleyfield and uh, I think it was Esk paper mills. Um, so he's an interesting character, which we're also following up on. But one of my favorites is this guy, William Brutton. He was a serving fireman in uh, the Irish Railways uh, Fire Brigade based in Dublin, but their railway works in Dublin. Um, he was for a number of years the captain there, um, but he got pulled up into the British military. When he left the, the British military, he was asked what he wanted to do, and he said, I want to be a fireman again. So they sent him to Gretna, and he stayed at Gretna until he died there. Um, again, another very interesting story that we're doing genealogically. Um, his brother actually went there as well. So um, James was also a, a fireman there. So another one, just to fill you in, this is a bit of a sad one. David Innes was a fireman at, uh, in, in Edinburgh. Um, fireman driver at Gretna, but he suffered a fall on a rescue drill and was killed and had uh, a full service funeral. Um, and as you can see, he was buried uh, in Glasgow um, near a family. Now we've got a number of uh, other big uh, lines of inquiry. We're looking at people who were awarded medals for firefighting. Uh, these are a few names. Maud Bruce is probably the fa uh, most famous, um, responsible for dealing with two fires, uh, a team leader, a squad leader uh, over in at the Mossman Cordite Ranges. Uh, the, some of the others, very brave um, actions, um, you know. Uh, but, but non-trained firefighters, I think it's brilliant, you know, but there you go. So what happened after, after the war? Well, a lot of the fire engines and fire brigade stuff, uh, equipment was sold off. This is a picture of Staveley Coal and Eel, uh, an iron depot, Staveley in um, Derbyshire. And the fire engine on the left, uh, right hand side, is Gretna's old uh, Dennis, as you can see, with a new registration number. I think. Um, one of the Merryweathers was sold to Henrith um, in Cumbria and uh, served for a number of years. And we also know that there are at least four of these old uh, volunteer fire brigade tokens 
Um, Devil's Porridge have got two, and there's another couple in private collection. Um, there's uh, some badges, uh, uh, sorry, some buttons, and there is only one that we know of example of this cat badge. Um, although I have to admit that just recently we've lost track of uh, the gentleman that owned it. Uh, I hope he's okay. Um, ongoing investigations are taking place. Right, East Riggs Fire Station. That's what it looks like. Oop, let's go back. I can. East Riggs Fire Station now uh, private houses. Um, I've, I've never had the courage to go and knock on the door and see if the, the front rooms have got any books hanging out the ceiling for where the harnesses were for the horse drawn vehicle. But um, one day I might strike up courage to do it. Uh, Annan Road, uh, the Gretna Main Fire Station. Uh, for many years, the site was used as a garage and sold cars. But now it is the brand new Gretna Co-op. Gretna now has its own fire station, part of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, uh, manned by on-call firefighters. And that is their vehicle. And um, I put these in because um, East Riggs for many years, up until 2010, had its own fire brigade attached to the armaments depot that was there. Um, that's the fire engine with the fire station in the background. That's the fire engine. And then we've got Longtown, which was where the Cordite Ranges are. That is still a, a military depot. Uh, these photos were taken a number of years ago, and they're not the most modern, um, mainly because uh, it is a sensitive area, and we, we just use some old photos. Um, that's one of the fire engines that's there. That's the other one. And thank you very much for your attention. Um, that's me when I was a fireman, and that's me uh, when I was representing the British Fire Service um, out in Greece, uh, being the flag bearer. So uh, thank you very much. I will put up the next one because there, uh, right at the top, you'll see thanks to Laura and all at Devil's Forage. If you get the chance to go there, please go there. Fabulous museum. You'll love it. And I can also recommend the tea and cakes. Thank you very much. Oh, brilliant, Nigel. That was amazing. A really great and insightful talk. And I learned so much. We've got a couple of great questions actually in the chat. Uh, Peter's asked, what was the role of the danger building officers? Right. Danger building officers went around and basically checked um, you had danger building officers and danger building visitors. Danger building officers oversaw um, things like um, welding and other uh, very dangerous activities within a, dare I say, a, uh, an environment, uh, an explosives environment. Danger building officers went round and checked, for instance, that there was nobody smoking, there was nobody carrying anything they shouldn't be doing, and they were following the rules that were laid down by uh, the Royal Laboratories at Woolwich Arsenal, who uh, oversaw most of the explosive production within the country. Most of the building officers, danger building officers, were had some military connection, um, not so the danger building uh, uh, visitors and Gretna had uh, at least one female danger building officer, uh, a, a danger builder visitor, whose uh, job was no different to the men. Uh, I won't go into whether she was paid the same, but she would have been visiting at all times, day and night, snap inspections to make sure everything was uh, going along, they were following the rules. They understood what their escape routes were. They understood about uh, firefighting. 
um, where they could get emergency first aid equipment um, and that sort of thing. Ah, interesting. Oh, was that um, Agnes Muir, the, the female danger buildings officer? In one. Ah, they, we did some research on her actually because she's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you, if you want, if you want me to send that over to you, I'll happily do that. <laughs> um, we've got um, a, another question from Pat, who she said, "How were the women recruited, and did they have to meet any special criteria?" Um, basically, the, the simple answer to that is um, no. There was no special criteria. There was no entrance exams or physical or anything like that. It was um, it was almost done on on not what you know but who you know. So if you joined in with a group of your fellow workmates, and um, can I give you an example? Yes, I can give you an example. Banbury, um, which was a shell filling factory for uh, gas uh, chemical weapons. Um, they had a female fire brigade, and basically, uh, it was 99 times out of 100 decided over a cup of tea uh, um, whether you were suitable to join the clan, if you like, and become a female firefighter. So there was no set um, training or anything like that, examination. Um, and missions were to become a firefighter. Ah, uh, Rob's showing his uh, train knowledge. Nice to see the spark arrester on the chimney of the locomotive in that picture you showed. Um, yeah, and... Not all of them had them, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> We've got another question from Peter. He said, are there any official reports of major fire incidents in the factory? Uh, the only reports there are are uh, coroner's inquest reports and there's one to do with obviously the explosion that killed Roberta mm -hmm. but major fire no um, you, you have to basically remember that in the first world war um, if you had an explosion, it was normally investigated and all dealt with within a week. Uh, you had a um, somebody from um, what was it in effect the factory's inspectorate or the explosives inspectorate. They came along, they did an inspection, they wrote a report, and um, a lot of those. There is one on um, the, the Roberta Robertson incident. There are, as I say, some coroner's inquests, but in, in real terms, there's nothing like uh, you would get these days, no. The reason I'm asking, Nigel, is that um, my grandfather told me that he was responsible for a, um, a fire that, um, that set some pancreas station on fire. Ah, right. And I'm trying to Sorry, find out about it. I thought you were talking about um, Gretna. Well, I was, but the thing is that um, I'm, I've just not found anything about this this fire anywhere else. And but, so that's why I wondered if there were official reports into fires. Yes, in, in, the, in the metropolitan area of London, in the First World War, there were copious reports now, uh, they may be in um, the, the Metropolitan Archive or London Fire Brigade Museum may have them. Oh, they right. have a number of uh, report books. Now, the problem is that London Fire Brigade Museum is not open at the moment because it's being moved into new premises and all of their documents Rather like the Museum of Fire up in Edinburgh, their, uh, a lot of their documents are um, put into, uh, dare I say, uh, storage and are difficult to get at, the same as in London. Um, if you get hold of Laura and you send me an email, I'll gladly uh, give you some um, advice on, on how to get into that. No Great. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah.
Absolutely, that um, I, I'll connect you both. Um, Pat said the mysterious Janet Smith Daniels, and that's because Janet Smith Daniels was one of the women. I think Pat um, maybe a couple of months ago was uh, trying to research, but just because of her her Smith surname or name, it it has proved very difficult. She's still been very elusive. Okay, I will look out what we've got. Ah, oh, great. Um, <laughs> Whether it's any whether it's going to help Pat or not, I don't. Know. <laughs> um, Andy said GWA hasn't been at Gretna for a few years. No, it hasn't. Um, basically, what happened was um, we were asked by the current, um, dare I say, security at Longtown. Um, uh, and uh, other places to not um, show modern photographs. And unfortunately, I forgot that uh, they had a change actually at Gretna Fire Station. Um, I, I, and I, I've not got a modern vehicle at Gretna either, but I just wanted to do historically that they now had a proper fire engine. Um, not, not uh, just the length of phones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rob said, um, thank you, Nigel. Excellent. Uh, seconded for Devil's Porridge. Managed it en route elsewhere earlier this year. Oh, thanks for that, Rob. Um, Senga said, many thanks. Very interesting. And Judith said, thanks, Nigel. Fascinating stuff. Lots of uh, appreciate comments of appreciation. Is any oh, sorry. Sorry, Nigel. Cut you off then. <laughs> right. Has anybody else got any questions? Feel free to unmute and ask if you want or put them in the chat. Now we've done found them. <laughs> um, if not, um, though, I will... Uh, I'll, I'll... I think one of the most fascinating things that, that as an ex-fire officer I find about this subject is the amount of explosives and dangerous chemicals you had there. Yeah. Um, and the, in, in real terms, uh, this was not the only factory that had this sort of number of magazines with you know, all these nasties just sat there waiting to be transported. Can you imagine 6,000 tonnes of explosives? Um, it's, it's unimaginable, that's the thing, isn't it? Pleasant to think about it, but you know, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah I've never seen it quantified like you did on, on your slides and that was so it was yeah brilliant just to bring it to just just how much was there not just in the cordite itself but in the making of the cordite it's absolutely fascinating yeah if anybody's out there and, and especially for the fire brigade community and they want to um pick up on it um I'm sure that somewhere if you put a, a comment, please not too adverse, um, on um, one of the websites, I'll, I'll pick it up and we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll try and answer it. Um, and look out for the book when, when we get a publisher. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Right. Um, well, I will um, thank you again, Nigel, because that was an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, but I, I'll bring this meeting, this meeting, this talk to a close. Um, and I want to thank you all for attending virtually um, and for your great questions at the end.